an NBA star with the way he plays basketball. He discovered the world from a very young age and along the way, as he says, picked up an American accent, a French name, a Fijian disposition, love of languages and European food. He's just returned home to Canberra after no ordinary journey to Bangladesh and joins us now. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Thank you so for excited me. to talk to you. Tell us about this journey and how it began. Well, first of all, let me just say, I'm not sure my style of play is NBA quality, but. <laughs> Uh, I just returned from Bangladesh uh, with Australian Youth Ambassadors for Development, which is an AusAid funded program that sends young people aged 18 to 30 years old overseas to developing countries to work with local NGOs, uh, government organizations, small charities in order to uh, work in the development field and get some experience. Okay, now we are going to see a taste mm. of this uh, experience on No Ordinary Journey today yep. on Channel 10 at 3 p.m. <laughs> How excited are you? Extremely. <laughs> it's been a, a little while in the making and uh, it doesn't quite seem real. I, I always tend to have difficulty explaining what the experience was like, so I'm hoping that this would help people understand just what it's like working and living in a developing country. All right, now let, let's put some perspective into this. We've got the vision coming up now. What is the reality of life for people? in Bangladesh. What did you experience? Look, it's very difficult life. It's 150 million people in a territory the size of uh, Tasmania. 60% uh, to 70% of the people live on less than a dollar a day. Uh, a dollar a day in Bangladesh doesn't get you as far as one would imagine. I think the stereotype is that a dollar in a developing country goes far. But it really doesn't give you that power of, uh, of, of wage. It doesn't give you options. It doesn't really yeah. let you move yourself out of the cycle of poverty that you may find yourself in. It's a harsh country, it's flooded every single year, it's constantly hit by cyclones, there's never enough food to go around, there's always political tension, it's a very difficult place to be in. Okay, what about for, for yourself, how did you accept this life and I, did you ever think, oh, I want to go home, you know, what about, you know, acclimatising, you know, personal space, you know, culture? Look, I never felt like I needed to come home. I never felt like I was in danger. I never felt that I was being left unsupported. One of the benefits of the Youth Ambassador Program is that they make sure that you're comfortable and secure and you have the necessary training before you go over to be aware of the circumstances that may exist. Okay. Personally, I couldn't wait to get there. I've, I've always been headed towards working in the international development field, so it really was a, a privilege to be able to go over there and do what I was doing. Okay. Uh, I was working with Habitat for Humanity, which uh, is, a, is an organization that builds houses for people that can't afford it. It tries to lift people out of poverty by giving them a home of their own. Uh, that stops disease, it stops things like a lack of security, lack of privacy, which are things we take for granted here. It was difficult, especially when we were hit by a cyclone about three months into my uh, assignment there, which wiped out millions of homes and, and we lost hundreds of thousands of lives. But again, at no point did I feel like I needed to come back. The work just took precedence. The, the task at hand was the very the paramount thing in my mind and I never thought that it was too much. What about em emotionally, the emotional toll? How did you handle that? It was, it was up and down. Um, I've always used basketball as a release. I've used, always used basketball as a way to I guess calm myself or find some focus. So I tried to find a basketball court and it's, it's actually that story which brings us to uh, an organization that I created that myself and three other guys created which uses basketball to tackle youth poverty and social disadvantage around the world. It was out, through looking for an outlet for myself that I found another way to give back. Okay, tell us the moment you found this dusty basketball <laughs> court in the Dakar. Um, you have to understand, Dhaka is constantly being rained on. It, it's a, a wet, hot, tough climate, uh, always dust, always dirt. Uh, so many people in, in the country, that there's constantly dust flying around. I sought a basketball court and someone said that there's this one here, that there's a basketball court available. So I trekked on along and, and had trouble finding it because obviously I didn't speak uh, Bangla and no one spoke English. After finding it, after two hours of trekking, I finally found this court. <laughs> And it was like a scene out of a bad movie. Uh, there's myself and a foreigner on the other side of the court and another foreigner on the other side of the court and a local on one side of the court. And it sounds cliched, but our eyes met from across the court. And uh, before we knew it, we were forming a team uh, just to have an outlet for basketball. Uh, before we knew it, we had kids asking us to coach them. So the coaching began. Once the coaching began, we saw that there was a need to create tournaments. So we created tournaments. But what we did was we used the money we raised to give back to charity. It was so successful the first time we did it that we just kept doing it. 
couple of months into it, we realized that we had literally an army of kids that were ready, willing, and able to compete in tournaments, run camps. Kids from high socioeconomic uh, uh, areas were playing with kids from the slums, which had never happened before. We had girls playing in our competitions, which just did not happen in Bangladesh. Uh, it's just frowned upon, but somehow, because we were running these tournaments, it seemed okay, and everyone seemed to be happy with it. Through that work, we started going to schools and orphanages using basketballs and outlets to help kids, bringing them food, water, clothing, shoes, uniforms, textbooks. Uh, that was 18 months ago, and in 18 months, we've moved that process in that program to four other countries around the world. Including Wollongong. Oh, and Wollongong. <laughs> don't, don't, Wollongong has now jumped on board, which is fantastic. Uh, that's the beauty of what we're doing. Basketball is such a simple concept. It's such a simple game. And it's so easy, so accessible, and so easy to, to play. Uh, so when people saw that we were using that to tackle poverty, it was a no-brainer. The amount of support we've received is incredible. Have you achieved what you wanted to achieve, because I know that you've wanted to follow in your father's footsteps, yeah, which absolutely. is another whole interview in <laughs> yeah. itself. Yeah. Are you getting some sleep? No, not at all. Okay. <laughs> but it is okay. better. What little sleep I am getting is much better. Uh, oh. it, it's, as you said, I mean, I've always wanted to follow both my parents' footsteps. They both worked for the United Nations. And I never felt like I was doing enough. And somehow through this, through this side, uh, endeavor through the Big Bang, somehow this is making sense. Somehow this is, I guess, appealing to that side of me which wanted to do something a little bit more. You know, you always dream when you're, when you're about to go into development, you dream of working for the United Nations. But a lot of people don't realize it's a huge organization with a lot of money, but not necessarily grassroots, ground level um, tackling of the problem. With Big Bangs, we're out in orphanages, we're out in schools, we're out on the streets playing basketball. I mean, it's not work. Playing basketball just cannot be work. I know, know that is the key quote. Right. <laughs> you don't work, you say, you just go out and play basketball, yeah. changing some lives of some pretty amazing uh, kids out there. I can't thank you enough for joining us this morning. Thank you so I much. I will be sitting tight at 3 p.m. <laughs> watching the show. A pleasure. It thank is an so honour to meet you, time. Pierre. You so Take much. care. All righty. A quick look at our top five. Now, Dubbo's Biennial Arts and Crafts.